2022 and, and the announcement um, came that, that uh, Ryan Glen was being shut down. What, what was the reaction among yourself and, and the other people working there? I think a lot of shock and surprise, you know, um, when you work somewhere you can sort of tell if it's if it's doing okay and you can see what, what the kind of state of things are and I think a lot of the staff were quite surprised because the factory was busy, it was running well um, and, and no major issues. So I think there was, there was a lot of surprise and a bit of shock really. So do you think the previous owners, Dale Farm, have, have made a bad business decision here given that you've managed to, to, to revive the place and, you, and you, you, you're uh, kind of running up business again? Um, I don't know if I would say that. I think there was there was reasons for for why they closed the site. They were looking at the wider business. They were looking at their overall strategy, and they were considering all all their options. So, I think what um, what what makes sense at a high level, sometimes at a local level, you can just see the the, the counter or the potential. So, I don't know if it was the wrong decision at their level. But I think there's definitely an opportunity more locally for for Rowan Glen to, su- to succeed. So, um, how are you going to get the the, the brand back um, then uh, after the close down? I mean, I certainly, you know, it's it's a brand name that I've seen on supermarket shelves in the past. But um, I suppose there's, there's quite a lot of choice out there if you go to the supermarket in terms of different um, yogurt brands. And how how do you get your name back out there? Well, we've been fortunate. We're in a number of retailers fairly quickly. Even even January this year, we managed to get back into two or three, and we've increased that number. Um, it does take a lot of time. I think the, there is a demand there for the product. It's a, it's a Scottish product. It's a, of a good quality. And I think that uh, if the demand's there and we, and we do our job well and keep the quality there, then it just it does take time with supermarkets. It's not, it's not a quick process to go through to be set up for for supply um, but we'll, we'll work away and we'll get there OK well thank you very much Alan for joining us and uh, all the best to you for the future that's Alan Baxter there who's uh, the new boss of the revived Rowan Glen yogurt factory business uh, now you're listening to Lunchtime Live with Barry Stewart and Andrew Black the time is now half past twelve on digital radio FM your smart speaker and on BBC Sounds BBC Radio Scotland It's time for news and sport from the borders with David Knox. Good afternoon. The body of a 76-year-old man was discovered yesterday morning in the Yarrow area just south of Selkirk. Police, fire services, ambulance and mountain rescue teams were involved in the search. A Police Scotland Scotland spokesperson said that the death was being treated as unexplained but that there did not appear to be any suspicious circumstances. They added that the persons next of kin are aware and a report will be submitted to the Procurator Fiscal. Health bosses are appealing for people to stay away from Borders General Hospital's emergency department unless their condition or injury is life-threatening. The appeal comes as the number of people waiting for admission to the hospital is continuing to grow. As an alternative to attending A&E, NHS Borders is advising people to call NHS 24 on 111. While staying with the emergency department, health bosses in the borders have progressed plans to spend an additional £1 million, bringing the region's only A&E department up to a safe staffing level. The emergency department at Borders General Hospital is severely understaffed, with only a single junior doctor on duty between midnight and 8 in the morning. The three registered nurses, who also provide overnight care, are reported to be unable to manage the volume of patients, with waits beyond 12 hours currently amongst the worst in the country. NHS Borders Board has been told that the situation is very high risk and that more doctors, emergency nurse practitioners and registered nurses are urgently needed. Approval has been given for spending an additional £1.1 million on staff. The Chief Executive Rafe Roberts admits funding remains a huge challenge. There, there won't be immediate fixes, I suppose, for two reasons. One, regardless of the decisions we make at this point, that that requires us to recruit um, and attract staff um, and, and that would always take um, some time. Um, but it also, I think it's really important we recognise the financial context that we're working in and we have to begin to make progress to get our finances back into financial balance. And if we can't demonstrate how we can do that, then we are not going to be able to make these um, improvements in key services. The 68-year Jedburgh has reopened following a two-vehicle crash this morning. Emergency services were called to the crash site at Bon Jedward at around 7.40. The road reopened just before quarter past nine.
Councillors will be asked this week to find £1 million to help sport, leisure and culture in the region, with the charity Lord Borders stating that a further £500,000 may also be required to maintain the current services. Robin Wiley has the details. Live Borders is responsible for the operation and management of 30 sport and leisure facilities, as well as 23 culture facilities, such as museums and libraries. It also runs 10 community centres and 12 town halls. But problems over the past few years led Scottish Borders Council to commission a full-scale review into how the charity operates, with a 26-point overhaul being agreed just last month. The council, who own all of the facilities, already gave Live Borders £500,000 back in March to keep it afloat, and the authority also U-turned on its planned £246,000 annual grant cut. But the financial problems have continued, with a £1.5 million shortfall in Live Borders finances now being identified. Councillors will this week be asked to use £1 million of reserves to support the Trust through to the end of the financial year, while Live Borders are to explore staffing and banking arrangements in a bid to balance the books. Members of the Council have, though, been warned that they may need to provide an additional £500,000 before the end of March. Well, looking back at weekend sport now, and in rugby, Hoyk defeated Jed Forrest 59-14 in the Premiership, and Kelso gained revenge for a home defeat to Selkirk by winning 27-0 at Philip Hawk. Kelso player coaches Bruce McNeil. I have to credit the boys for their commitment during the two weeks off. You know, they bought into the fact that, we, you know, the weather conditions stopped us playing for a couple of weeks and, and we decided that we'd work really hard through the two weeks and make sure that we came into this game fully prepared. The reward, you know, for definitely put in the, the past two weeks, that reward's just phenomenal and it just means that, you know, we keep the ball rolling and, and we'll, we enjoy training, we enjoy getting better and we enjoy the victories just as well. In National League Division 1, Melrose are up to third after a 34-22 win over Highland, but Gala went down 35-21 to leaders air. In National 2, Peebles are now top of the league after a 32-13 win at home to Falkirk. Football in the Lowland League, Gala Feridine Rovers lost 4-2 at East Kilbride, while Berwick Rangers went down 2-1 at Cumbernauld Colts. In East of Scotland Leagues, Vale Leithen lost 5-1 at Leith Athletic, and there are 2-0 wins for Tweedmouth Rangers and Linton Hotspur against Stirling University and Edinburgh Community, respectively. Now for the Borders weather, with all the details, here's Gillian Smart. Hello there. It'll be mostly cloudy across the borders this afternoon with showers drifting in from the east, feeling chilly with highs of 4 to 7 Celsius. Tonight it'll turn drier for a time before a band of showery rain arrives from the west towards dawn, lows of 1 to 4 Celsius. And tomorrow will be a wet day. A Met Office yellow warning of rain has been issued due to a risk of travel disruption and perhaps some flooding. It'll be breezy at times as well. BBC Radio Scotland weather for the borders. I'll be back with more news and sport for the borders at half past four. Get the latest news on your smart speaker whenever you want. Just say, play BBC News for Scotland. Now, the Prime Minister is under pressure from fellow Conservatives this lunchtime over his plan to send illegal immigrants to Rwanda. Updated proposals designed to mitigate the concerns of the Supreme Court were published last week and go before MPs tomorrow. Well, critics say the new plan could leave the government open to waves of appeals against deportation, but the Defence Secretary Grant Shapps disagrees. I do know that this is a bill that people like Lord Sumption, I think four other former Attorney Generals, respected people in the law, in other words, are saying uh, will be the right place to land this, would mean that 99.5% of challenges would fail. I think the thing to do here is unite and get behind this uh, bill, uh, but I think we should use our majority in the Commons to pass it. Well, Lauren McEvitt was a Tory advisor during the Cameron administration. Lauren, thanks for coming on to the programme. No worries. Um, what do you make of all this? I mean, to unite and get behind the bill, how, how likely is that? Oh, it's unclear as of yet. There's about six of these research groups that have done you know, some work over the weekend to, to produce their own views uh, on the proposals that came out last week. And my understanding is that those groups are meeting today and will give opinions probably this evening and into tomorrow. So as of yet, it's, it's unclear the success he's going to be able to have as Prime Minister in trying to get this through. Grant Shapps 
comments earlier are interesting um, uh, about using the majority in the Commons to get this through because we are running up against a timeline issue now. Um, if this passes in the Commons and fails in the Lords, there is not actually time um, in the parliamentary schedule before an election to put this through the Parliament Act um, because the Parliament Act has a year stipulation within it and we are, you know, we're into less than a year territory now. So... The Prime Minister has a, has a double-header issue. He has the problem of actually getting it through the legislative processes, and he has the problem of getting his own party to sign it off. Um, and although those issues overlap with each other, they are, in my opinion, distinct from each other as well. Yeah, and, you know, all these various groups of Tories meeting today to decide whether to back the bill or not. But, you know, any concessions made to one group will just anger another group, won't they? It depends. A lot of them may actually have common ground in some of the things that they object to, for, possibly for different reasons, um, but they, there will be common ground within them. And a lot of these research groups have a significant overlap in membership as well. Um, a lot of the sort of more right-wing sections of these groups will have some concerns about you know, the country or the government being forced to kowtow to what they view to be a European institution that no longer looks like the, uh, the, 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 the Convention on Human Rights that was signed up to 60 years ago, that, you know, it, we are not the only country to be looking at doing something like this. Germany is considering an option uh, to remove to another area. Um, I think possibly Denmark are as well. Don't I'm not 100% that that's the second country, but there are definitely two countries I've read about within the European Union considering something along these lines. A lot of the definitions that we're working with in relation to migration in particular, less so in relation to refugees, but particularly in relation to migration, um, are definitions that do not um, do not take into consideration the fundamental shift in modern transportation since they were drafted at the end of the 40s and into the beginning of the 1950s. The, the ease with which someone can get across the world now is very different. And so the concept of economic migration has to be, in my opinion, looked at from a definition point of view. But until such time as it is, the UK government is going to have some difficulties in, in, in how it attempts to distinguish between an economic migrant and a refugee reaching these shores through illegal means. Um, and it's going to have difficulty in the, 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 the choices it has in where to remove those people to should it wish to do offshore processing um, as it has indicated that it wishes to do. What would the consequences be, do you think, of a government defeat tomorrow? And, and do Tory MPs have much of an appetite to bring down Sunak? So, you know, it's a great question because Sunak went before the, the 1922 committee last week um, and, you know, and asked what I believe to be the dumbest question to ask a group of Conservative MPs ever, which is, would you prefer to fight the Labour Party or each other? Um, because there is no obvious clear answer to that, unfortunately. Um, the Conservative Party has always been described as a broad church, um, but in my opinion, that church has been getting significantly broader over the last couple of years. Um, and coming up to an election where it looks like my party will do particularly badly in many parts of the country, a lot of people are beginning to behave far more irrationally than you would normally consider them to. With that in mind, it's hard to tell if they will look to junk him now or if they're just going to spend the next 12 months jockeying for who may or may not be leader after an election loss, bearing in mind that all the people jockeying may not win their seats back. Um, but what I, what I have heard this morning is that the whips are are trying to get people on board by saying, look, if we lose this vote, he's going to call an election for January 2024. And almost nobody in the party is, is prepared to lose their seat in, in six weeks. All of them might be prepared to lose it in a year, but in six weeks, that changes the consideration a little bit. It certainly does. Uh, and in the meantime, though, we have got all sorts of kind of strange speculation about Boris Johnson linking up with Nigel Farage and possibly somehow Pretty Patel as well. You remember those irrational mo movements I mentioned? That's them. Okay, well, that's, 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 ne that's ne <laughs> never going to happen. Uh, the, 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 the significant mechanics involved in attempting to put a prime minister in who's not elected or appointed to any chamber, trying to get him appointed when appointments are made by, you know, recommendation from the government to the House of Lords Appointments Commission, trying to get Nigel Farage, you know, off the beach in Australia, signed up to a Conservative Party that he has systematically attempted to undermine for the better part of 25 years. All of these are just ridiculous. The idea that Pretty Patel could run the party 
that's less bonkers. She's in the House. She is elected to something. In theory, if they were to challenge the leadership, that's the most logical one of the three that you mentioned. But I think that Sunak's biggest danger from the logical, you know, the, the, the logical action point of view, which is somebody who's already elected making a challenge on the leadership, is probably Suella Braverman. Um, and that's, you know, that's the reason why he made her Home Secretary to begin with. That was the price of doing business for getting her to sign up to there not being a leadership challenge and a leadership, a full leadership competition when Liz Truss was leaving Downing Street, which neither the party nor the country could have afforded. So she is probably still the most dangerous person, amazingly enough, from my point of view. Lauren, thank you very much indeed. That's Lauren McEvitt, their former Tory advisor. Well, right now, Rishi Sunak is giving evidence to the UK COVID inquiry. He's already says he's deeply sorry to those who lost loved ones during the pandemic. And Mr Sunak was Chancellor when COVID struck. And he's also facing questions about the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which he launched in the summer of 2020. It was supposed to help the hospitality sector recover by offering discounted meals in pubs and restaurants. But Sir Patrick Vallance, who was the government's chief scientist, scientific advisor during the pandemic earlier told the inquiry that the scheme was highly likely to have increased COVID deaths. Well, let's speak now to uh, the restaurant and pub owner, Joe De Silva, who's in Inverness. Thank you for joining us, uh, Joe, on the programme. Um, what are your thoughts then on the, the Eat Out to uh, Help Out scheme looking back? Well, it was a, a double-edged sword, I think. I mean, hospitality was on its knees and the, the government had to do something to help. We did have, of course, the reduction in VAT, which was a great help, which was not on alcoholic drinks. It was on food and soft drinks. So that was a help, but the hospitality industry desperately needed help. And I think the government were in a difficult position. How do you help the hospitality industry? What could they do? They chose the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, which at the time was a good idea, but obviously looking back which we can all do we can all hindsight is a great thing yeah. but you know looking back at that to think was that really the best idea we were quite lucky we have a huge outside area that was a great summer for us that period of time the weather was good so most to be honest most of our clients were outside anyway but it did also mean that you had people who were coming into the pubs and restaurants they had this voucher and sometimes those customers could be quite difficult. They felt they were doing you a favour. So whilst it was pretty good in terms of getting the money into the businesses, it got people out. People had been inside for such a long time. And I do believe it got people out. But whether the best idea was to have people in a confined space in some of the restaurants, I'm not quite sure. Uh, do you think the, the, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme uh, made a difference between hospitality businesses going permanently bust or not? I think there were other ways the government could have looked at that and could have made better decisions. The administration side of that, it, there was an increase in administration for us, but from the government side, there must have been a huge increase in administration. And I do feel that had there been maybe that, that decrease across all aspects of hospitality, so, so to include alcoholic drinks as well, I think that would have been a far, far better better uh, decision. It was already there. The scheme was already there with that reduction in VAT. There was an increased... Um, uh, for, for us, we had to separate off the 5% VAT and the 20% VAT elements. Uh, so that was another burden on the hospitality industry anyway. So had they just done a, a blanket 5% VAT, I think that would have been a far, far better uh, use of the government's resources at that time. And maybe implemented more of the grant schemes that were in implemented by the, the councils and so on and so forth would have been better than the, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme. Uh, and what, what did you make of Sir Patrick Valance's comments then that the, the Eat Out to Help Out scheme was highly likely to have increased COVID deaths? Yeah, I think it's a valid point. I mean, I think we've... Well, at, that, at the time, the government made a decision based on the information that they had, and that was to implement the help, Eat Out to Help Out scheme. Um, but I, I can absolutely see how that would have Im it would have impacted the, the number of uh, COVID transmissions. Um, as I say, we were, we were very lucky, and a lot of our uh, co-restaurants and so on we were we were all doing our very very best, um, and I think the fact that that summer was a great summer helped a lot. But I certainly I think further south, where 
they don't quite have so many beer gardens, they don't have so many open spaces. You know, I can really see how that transmission would have increased in those confined spaces in, in smaller restaurants. And uh, just briefly, if you can, Joe, we're, we're now into the um, busy Christmas holiday period. How 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 are your businesses faring? Because there have been concerns in particular about uh, pub closures in Scotland recently. I mean, of course, there has been a number of pub closures um, across Scotland and hospitality is is still... It, it's, a, it's a difficult industry, a very difficult industry. We had COVID when people changed the whole way they socialised and um, that had a big impact. But I think the thing about Scottish hospitality is they they spin on a coin. You know, we will change as much as we can and as quickly as we can to make sure that the businesses are viable. And what we have seen are, are businesses who are maybe closing for a couple of days through the week. Historically, they'd have been open seven days. Now what they're doing is they're closing for a couple of days through the week and they're really looking for the times when people are the footfall is highest in the businesses so I think hospitality yes it is still struggling it's still having problems after Covid there are still the after effects but I am hopeful you know we have great hospitality it's what we're well known for in Scotland is hospitality so um, so I have, have great faith that uh, you'll still have your, your corner pubs and your great restaurants across the whole industry OK thank you very much Joe all the best to you uh, over the coming uh, busy Christmas period that's Joe De Silva there who's a restaurant and pub owner in Inverness you're listening to Lunchtime Live and still to come in the programme, the First Minister says the Foreign Secretary is petty after a row erupted between the Scottish and UK governments over Hamza Yusuf's meeting with the Turkish President at COP28. We'll be discussing that in a moment. And also West Lothian Council says it can't afford the £35 million cost of rebuilding its largest secondary school following the discovery of crumbling concrete. Now, Amy and Mabeth is back to talk about one of the great controversies in modern football. Do you think it is that, Amy, or is it just football fans oh. like, like us get a bit too overexcited about uh, VAR? Oh, I think so. And I guess when, you, when you're passionate about a team, and a f- <laughs> you, you love it or hate it. But yes, Andrew, that controversial technology, the week in, week out in the game, has fans and pundits like debating decisions made or ones that should have been looked at. Last year, the Fo- uh, Scottish Football Sports Association asked its members for their thoughts on it a few months after its introduction during the World Cup. A year on, they revisited it and found that the 2000 Seven, 2,710 sorry, who responded. 95% had an issue with how long it took to make decisions. 86% claim VAR has reduced the enjoyment of games. 85% believe refereeing performances have worsened during its in, since its introduction. And 66% would rather the game just played on without it and put up with mistakes. Well, I'm joined now by the SFSA Board Advisor, Alistair Blair. Good afternoon to you, Alistair. Hi, Amy. Hi, thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, thank you for coming we mentioned their results are maybe not entirely surprising because let's be honest football fans they're hard ones to please when it comes to you know changing the beautiful game or perhaps decisions that might go against their team well oh, I think that's that's right and again what the survey showed was that 62% believe their team has not benefited from far uh, so that, that's hardly a surprise but I, I think the most interesting thing is the, what you've actually referred to it's the changes since we did the first survey you would hope that with VAR having been in place for a year now, it would have improved. But every single metric shows the opposite, shows that fans are actually even more fed up with it and, and find that it's a reducing the enjoyment of the game. And it seems to me that that's a, a serious problem for football because it's getting worse rather than better. But technology in its various forms you know, has been working in other sports, rugby, tennis, cricket. I mean, how much of this dissatisfaction you know, from the members who responded you know, could be down to teething changes or resisting change in the game rather than it not working? I, I think that, that there's obviously a, a large percentage, again, going back to the figures you cited, of people who really just don't want it. Um, but there's also quite a large number of people who believe that it can be better. So, for example, you know, 92% of fans want goal line technology introduced. Now, I know that a lot of Scottish Premier Clubs can't afford that. Certainly my own club can't afford it uh, or certainly wouldn't like to have to pay for it. Um, Again, significant. 63% believe that fully automated offside would be a significant improvement. Um, now, given that we've got technology to drive cars through Scotland in four seasons of one day, avoiding pedestrians and stray dogs, it shouldn't be on beyond, shouldn't be on the wit of human beings to come up with technology which would allow, for example, offside to be fully automated instantaneous. The single biggest gripe, or one of the biggest gripes, is the the time taken. Again, you cited the figure in relation to that. You know, said the length of time is to take decisions is too long. If that can be reduced down to something which fans would find more 
acceptable and if technology can be made to do that then that would be highly desirable and te- technology always existed in football not just the technology if you know it nowadays but even things such as introducing goal nets back in the 90s made a huge total difference to the game so it's always been there but currently it's not working the way fans would like it to work so decisions should, will have to be taken in terms of okay well, so where do we go from here uh, I understand referees uh, who are a much maligned species and there is a shortage we, we need more referees we, we need to get referees into European games so they improve their skills we can't do that, that without VAR so it, it's very difficult yeah. it's, it's not a simple solution it certainly isn't but sorry well, we're running running out of time today sure, Alistair sure, 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 sure. <laughs> thank you so much we could talk about this for ages there's so much to debate in this and I'm sure we'll have many more discussions on the how thing that fans feel it can be improved at say, the SFSA board advisor Alistair Blair there Amy, thanks for that. Now, the First Minister has said the Foreign Secretary is petty after a row erupted between the Scottish and UK governments. Hamza Youssef met the Turkish President at the COP summit in Dubai, but the Foreign Office thought it had contravened protocol. Our political correspondent, Andrew Kerr, is following the story and joins us now. So, Andrew, just tell us more about uh, what's happened. Yes, Vary, this happened about 10 days ago, indeed, at the COP summit in Dubai. The First Minister met the Turkish President, President Erdogan. There was a bit of glad-handing at these summits, as there always is. And he had a brief conversation with President Erdogan, and he discussed the environment, uh, but also the Israel-Gaza conflict and Hamza Youssef's call for a ceasefire there. Now, there was no... UK official present, which there should be at these types of meetings, because there was a last minute change in time from the Turkish team. So the UK government thinks this breach protocol. So Lord Cameron, the new foreign secretary, is taking quite a hard line on this. And he's threatening that if there are any further breaches of protocol, there will be no further foreign office facilitation of meetings. And he's also threatened to close down Scottish government offices in UK government embassies and UK government posts. So this is a row that is kind of quite significantly erupted. So what's the First Minister said in response? Well, the Scottish Cabinet has been meeting in Dunbar today and this point was put to the First Minister there and he's not impressed by what Lord Cameron has said. To threaten to curtail the Scottish Government's international activity where we promote business, that where we talk about things that are really important, like, of course, the climate crisis, to threaten to curtail that, to be so petty, just because one of their officials couldn't make one of the meetings that we had, and they attended plenty of others, I think, as I say, it's not just petty, it's really misguided. And very Mr Yousaf was adding that any attempt to curtail that kind of Scottish government work overseas would ultimately harm the Scottish economy, and I suppose, therefore, the United Kingdom economy, which the Foreign Office are indeed trying to promote. So what might happen with this row? Yes, th- this has been bubbling for some time. The Foreign Office has had previous concerns about the Scottish government breaching protocol. But I think what happened here was I mentioned that Hamza Youssef was discussing the Israel-Gaza conflict with President Erdogan. Hamza Youssef calling for that ceasefire, which is not UK government policy. And I think, Vary, this is what particularly has upset the United Kingdom government, that the UK is not seen to be speaking with one single voice. And President Erdogan, a very significant place, and a big player in any Middle East conflict as well. So I think the UK government think that Hamza Youssef is best sticking to discussing issues like trade and tourism and the green economy with people like President Erdogan. I think for the Scottish government, they were uh, uh, trying to facilitate that meeting with the presence of a UK government official, but that change in timing meant the official didn't turn up there. So it's interesting to see how this might develop in the future. Thank you. That's our political correspondent, Andrew Kerr. From today, people who park their vehicles on pavements face a £100 fine after new laws came into force in Scotland, which aim to make things easier for pedestrians, especially people who are visually impaired. It is up to individual councils to enforce these rules, so it is possible that it won't be adopted everywhere in Scotland. Let's speak to Sandy Taylor, who's with the National Federation of the Blind. Uh, Hello, Sandy. Uh, Good afternoon, Andrew. Uh, Do you think this will work, then, this parking ban? Well, if it is enforced, uh, it is an obvious step forward, um, certainly from a blind person's perspective. um, It is uh, an added danger on our high streets. So you're you're blind yourself then. Um, 
is pavement parking something that has caused you problems in the past? Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, and the, the, the additional fast food takeaways in our high streets now is actually making the, the situation worse because right. people park on the pavement to pick up their, their orders. But, uh, but the other thing is, of course, that as we... Um, navigate using a long cane very often the cane can go underneath the vehicle and uh, he walk into the door mirror or, or something similar but right. there are many many other pavement hazards like uh, 